what's in the papers? I'm going to talk about the press again, and I've got to come up with some pretty similar points to uh, what Anthony talked about and what David talked about, but I hope there'll be something different in there. Um, but bane of the life of statisticians, I'm sure all the other statisticians here will recognize this. What do you do? Oh, I'm a statistician. Oh, that's terribly boring, isn't it? Uh, we, we've all got this image that's terribly boring, but actually, if you look in what's in the press, it's not boring at all. People don't find statistics boring. If they did, why would the newspapers be full of it? Because they absolutely are. Um, I, record, I, I recommend this as a way of uh, putting yourself to sleep on a boring day, on a day when you haven't got anything else to do, uh, buy all the uh, daily newspapers, all the UK um, dailies, go through them and find all the statistical stories. I've done this occasionally. It will take you a very long time because there's absolutely loads of them. And obviously, there are numbers in business pages, there are numbers in sports stories, kind of, you'd expect that. There are also numbers in the main stories. David's given some examples of that, some you know, really quite major stories, stories that come from ONS and so on. Uh, but there are also surveys, there are fillers at the bottom of pages, there are all sorts of silly things. So here's just a few examples from one day, which happened to be uh, a couple of years ago in 2013. So this was the lead story in The Telegraph. It was about um, children at risk of measles stemming from the MMR scare and the whole things like this. Um, and there's a lot of numbers in that, which um, I won't expect you to read. So there's a lot of text that you can't read even if you wanted to. Um, there's other things. There are infographics. This is one about heart disease risk variation uh, in heart disease risk across the country. This came from a big report by the British Heart Foundation. That's the version out of the Times. It has a map, which is not the best I've ever seen. Actually, the one in the mirror was better. Uh, one does find that from time to time. But there's a lot of other stuff as well. There are surveys, and things are full of surveys. So uh, this is from uh, a report of a survey that Witch did. Uh, this is the report in the mirror, and it says, nine out of 10 people want bankers banned if they balls up. A poll is revealed. It's probably not how Witch put it, but um, it's a... Uh, it's a survey, and it's a survey that which got in the papers for a particular reason. Here are a couple more. Actually, the bottom one by some amazing fluke, and the, honestly, this wasn't planned. It's one, it's one that Anthony used the press release from. It's a story based on a survey of what commuters get up to in sending texts and so on. It's commissioned by Info Security Europe, a trade show. And then when you get to the end, you find, actually, we need more security because we're doing all these things. And the one at the top there is actually not a survey. Story about theft in passports abroad. It's increased. Here's some work done by criminologists for a travel insurance company. So anyone with any wit about them knows why the interests involved have got those stories in the paper. There's quite a lot of that. But there are things which are much more trivial. There's this uh, particular feature of newspaper design. Actually, it's less popular than it was. Um, pulling out a number in a big story. So these are numbers which might be in the story. They might not be in the story. The one about Sandy Hook there from The Independent, that number wasn't in the story, but it was given a lot of prominence. The Daily Mail ones actually come from the book review section. Uh, if you don't read the Daily Mail, you may not realize it has book reviews, but it has. And they just kind of stuck those in the middle for no apparent reason. But they're not my favorite. This is my favorite. It's quite old now. It's from The Guardian. Uh, these people named were some hikers, American hikers, who accidentally strayed over the border into Iran and were arrested. Now, there were no other numbers in this story, apart from the fact the 6th of February was when their trial was going to start. But they had some space, big red number, draw attention to the story. They kind of do that. Um, and there are fillers in the bottom of the columns. These are quite common in um, design of particularly tabloid newspapers, the sun and the mirror. They've got a bit of space, and they fill something up. So the sun one over there on the, on, on, on the left-hand side, that's a pole that found out something. Not very good poll, but it's a poll. And here are another three that appeared at different places in the paper that day. Um, a poll found something, the other two don't have things in. Now, why they do this? They do this because they need to fill up the page and because you can say a lot in a small space with numbers. You might wonder why I'm wasting your time on these kind of trivial things. The reason I think this is more important than you might think is because stories about numbers like this affect people's general attitudes towards numerical information. They're bombarded with this stuff in the press and it affects what they think in a way that's arguably more pervasive than what Hans Rosling might do. So it's, I think it's important that we're aware of all this. OK, so just a few words about surveys. Where do all the survey results come from, the report in the paper? Well, we've seen some of this already. It might be a good government, um, you know, something run by the ONS or something. It might be something perfectly respectable done by a big market researcher, polling companies. But there are also PR companies who are there to provide 
survey information to get your name in the papers if you're a business. Now, uh, here's just an example of that. This is a story from the Daily Mail earlier on this year. Uh, cheers to retirement. Typical OAPs have a good time. I like this story because I'm kind of getting towards this age. And they find a survey, it says a survey in the first bullet point, found the typical pensioner enjoys three slap-up meals out per month. That sounds pretty good, doesn't it? And there's a lot of stuff like this. Um, and it's written by no less than a, a business correspondent for this paper, so this must be kind of respectable stuff. It's quite a substantial story, full of detail, 750 words. Um, and then right down towards the bottom of it, you find out who did the survey. It was Senior Rail Card, who run a rail discount scheme, if you didn't know. Um, and it says what the sample size is, doesn't say anything else. And then somebody from Rail Card says various stuff about how marvelous it is. And the last sentence there, retirees place a lot of importance on travel. It doesn't actually say, and they should all go out and buy a senior rail card. Uh, this was also in the Telegraph, which did say that, and it was in several um, other provincial papers. Um, where I actually got this from was the website of one of these organizations. SWNS Group, it runs various things. It's, it's a big independent press agency, but it also has something called 72 Point, who are the original PR survey pioneers. Um, they help increase brand and campaign exposure for their clients. PR, uh, and then they say they're moving on to multi-platform content. But what they do is they do PR surveys. I mean, they don't, don't make any bones about it. This is what they do. And in order to get the surveys done, they have their own survey organization, OnePoll.com. I should declare an interest here. I'm on the OnePoll.com panel. They pay me 10 or 15p every now and then uh, for <laughs> filling in some of their surveys, I mean, which I do to find out what their questions design is like. Uh, so the strapline pulse of the people, they generate news. And, you know, they do the whole service. They run the survey. They write the story. It's so you go and pay them some money, they will get your name in the papers by doing surveys. Seriously, they will. Um, that's what they do. And I think it's very interesting from the point of view of a statistician to think about what's wrong with that. The surveys, some of the questionnaire design is awful. Some of it is pretty good, in my view. It's not that bad. When the things are in the paper, you know who did it, because that's the whole point. The whole point is getting the people's name in the paper. So. The ways in which this is different from uh, what you might call responsible survey reporting of a serious kind are actually quite subtle and need a bit of thought. But anyway, I haven't got time to go into that. Moving on, what I'm going to do is to take apart a typical statistical story, whereby I'm typical. I don't mean the sort of uh, things which have actually got consequence that other, other speakers have talked about a lot. I'm going to talk about one that is not quite that important, I'd argue, and it's also quite strange. Makes some points I want to make. Uh, this actually came from one of the questions that a loyal listener of more or less sent in. It was one that wasn't used on the program or not yet. Uh, the listener said that, that he or she had found a surprising figure in an article in the Metro. If you don't know what the Metro is, here's today's Metro. It's a free newspaper, the world's most popular free newspaper. It's generally given out to commuters on the way into big British cities. And I, I just picked this up so you'd see what it's like. So uh, below the picture of the attractive young woman, number of homes for sale hits a record low, page two. So a statistical story referred to on the front page. It's referring to some data from the um, Royal Institute of Chartered Surveyors. Quite an interesting story, actually. There we are. Anyway, it's in the metro, that's what it said. Motorway toll is three casualties per mile, and this detail is 3.86, their rounding isn't that good. Um, and they say it was higher in the southeast of England than it was in Scotland. And drivers should not be complicated, said swiftcover.com, which obtained the figures. Well, swiftcover.com, who's that? Um, now, what this uh, listener had done is try to work out what this meant. Looked up on Wikipedia how many miles of motorway there are in the UK, and found that this meant over 8,000 people per year die on UK motorways. Can this be right? Well, it's not really right, because it's killed or injured. The, the, keep that in mind. There's a strange thing to do with that. But on the other hand, it still seems like quite a big number. Uh, and the listener said, um, you know, does this make sense? Well, I went and looked it up. I couldn't find a print copy of the Metro, well, no doubt it's in newspaper library, but it's still there online. Uh, you won't be able to read that, so I'll pull out some bits. They had a nice map with area for area figures. Great Britain, what the length of motorways was, how many casualties there were. And they say it's those killed or seriously injured. Does the button on this thing work? No. Anyway, it's those killed or seriously injured. Right. And there's the data. And then they say various things about it. Chilling figures have revealed, and they, they repeat a lot of the same things. And then you get to the bottom of the story. Swiftcover.com product manager Roman Brill said various things. Um, right. So. That. It makes you think, well, maybe this was done by Swift Cover. It has to be said, the Metro was not the only paper that picked this up. This was picked up by the Press Association, a press agency that produces information for um, 
often used by regional newspapers, and they have a story which covers similar sorts of things. Uh, they tell you the figures come from the Department for Transport, and they say they were highlighted by SwiftCover.com. They actually do take it further. They did go further than, than SwiftCover and talk to the Highways Agency, who did say some um, things which are repeated there. Now, here's what SwiftCover.com Dot com say SwiftCover is a subsidiary of AXA insurance that sells uh, motor insurance online. So there's a bit of the story. Um, and just pulling out a bit, there's a lot of information like we've seen before. And it's analysis of DRT data, as they say. And here's what the product manager said. And, uh, you know, motorways are safe, but they're not that safe. And then he actually goes on to more. He gives advice for motorway users. Those are the first two points. There are a lot more, which didn't get into the papers. But anyway, that's what he did. Um, and it's press release. It's a press release. It comes from their PR agency. Well, here are some of the, this is a tiny bit of the uh, Excel spreadsheet that's got those Department for Transport figures in. This is kind of the important bit. This is the total killed, KSI is killed or seriously injured, uh, and the total all casualties in motorways in Great Britain. Uh, this is a bit of the swift cover thing, and you find, yeah, 8732, it's the same, they got the numbers right, but they didn't, because the swift cover thing says it's deaths or serious injured, uh, the killed and serious injured is far less. So the numbers aren't even right. Um, so the, what's going on, the real data, for Great Britain as a whole, the number killed per mile is 0 0.04, killed and seriously injured 0.34, nowhere near what they said it was. Uh, the regional disparities aren't in the right place. Uh, but you can't actually make sense of these regional, regional comparisons because the numbers are too small. So what really went on here is somebody, and I don't know who it was, did some calculations, put out a press release for PR purposes. They got the nature of the casualties badly wrong. Um, in any way, it's not clear that casualties per motorway mile means very much, you know, because it doesn't take account of the traffic density. The Metro picked it up. They did a nice map, except that it's wrong. Now, Metro readership's about three and a half million. So a lot of people, this went out before a lot of people. Press Association picked it up. It was in lots of regional papers. More people read it. Nobody seems to have checked the definition of casualties. So they repeated what was in the press release. But maybe that's not too bad. No one seems to have asked whether the statistic made sense. Presumably Swift Cover are happy because they got lots of coverage. Journalism at its uh, most glorious. Uh, right, a couple of words about why there are numbers in the media. I won't say much about this. Well, they're there for news purposes, but they're also there for PR, for entertainment, for decorating the page. And I think that's got something to do with the special status of numbers as facts in our society, which means you can use them to add authority, you can use them as rhetorical devices, and you can use them for all sorts of purposes. They've got nothing to do with the reason the statistics were produced in the first place by ONS or whoever it was. So, What's so special about that? I think this has got to do with the what, public attitudes to numbers and the fact that numbers are solid facts, so they must be correct. But in many cases, they self-evidently aren't. So what is going on there? They're absolute truths and at the same time, lies and damn lies. Um, and that makes things difficult. Now, there's a lot of theory behind all this uh, his, by historians, by analysts of journalism. There we are, references. I shouldn't be putting those up. But anyway, I haven't got time for it today. So I shall move on to my last point, set of points. This is advice that I give to statisticians on working with journalists. Now, there are a lot of statisticians here, a lot of people who aren't statisticians. I hope it will help those who aren't statisticians to understand where we are coming from. Working with journalists. This is what statisticians think of journalists. Journalists are enumerate. Journalists don't understand quantitative reasoning, etc., etc. Uh, journalists distort and oversimplify statistical information and conclusions. And journalists won't listen to us. And we know what we're talking about, don't we? Uh, however, I've worked with journalists quite a lot. This is what journalists think of statisticians. Statisticians are illiterate. <laughs> statisticians are pedantic. Uh, we make the story so boring that it doesn't come across. Uh, we concentrate so much on the ifs and buts that the overall message disappears. And we won't listen either. Um, now, these are stereotypes, but I'm afraid there is something in this. Um, and this is my kind of take-home message for statisticians. We have to remember that journalists are different. They're, work, you know, they're not statisticians. They're working in a different way. Nothing wrong with that. They're doing a different job. Here are some ways they're different. Statisticians don't have such short time scales as journalists do. Deadlines don't mean the same to us. Now, there are exceptions among statisticians, particularly people working in the GSS. Uh, but on the whole, that's, that's it. Journalists have to work within the idea of an agenda that their media... Who, you know, the newspaper they're writing for and something might have. Um, 
and they need to take that into account. And there's this strange idea of news value, what's newsworthy that they need to get across. And there's also the pressure to be personal, to talk about what Mrs. Bloggs of witness uh, says or how she reacted to some particular drug rather than saying this is, uh, you know, this, this, this helps most people who've got a particular disease. That pressure's there for good reasons because it can get the story across. And we have to understand that that's what's there. That's the sort of thing that journalists think about, even though we're trained out of doing that. Okay, but we have to recognize that journalists have strengths that most statisticians don't have. Journalists are better at knowing their audience than we, than, than we do. Of course, we'll all be better now. Hannah's told us we must all do this. Uh, journalists are good at getting things across in a short space. They don't overrun their lot of time, as I'm about to. And journalists are generally better at telling stories than we are. And we need to understand that. So this is what I tell statisticians. Don't blame journalists for getting things wrong. Help them to get things right. In my experience, Journalists are pretty good at taking advice on board. They want to get things right as much as we want them to get things right. And we need to engage, we need to work with them. Journalists will respond to that, and they respond positively. So, thank you. Thank you, Kevin. We've got time for two short questions. Uh, to kick us off, what's the solution to the journalism? Um, I think the solution is, the main solution is in educating readers to recognize it when they see it, because I don't think it's going to disappear. I mean, we can all criticize journalists for just quoting the press release back and not checking all the details. But this assumes there are enough journalists to check the details. And you know, you know, there have been huge cuts in the numbers of journalism in, in, in many newsrooms on national newspapers. Um, and they don't necessarily have time to do it. I think we need to engage directly, if we can, though this would have to be done through journalism, with um, the public on um, telling them what to watch out for. Um, David and I had a go at that once. Didn't, <laughs> didn't meet with a huge deal of success. But it's getting people to know how they need to cope with it. I, I mean, the, I don't think journalism is ever going to disappear. I work within the NHS and it, it feels a bit at the moment like we have to rebrand the word statistics because the minute you mention statistics, patients seem to think that you want to do something horrible to them. And <laughs> I'm having to say now that I want to collect information that I can use that will help other patients in your situation, but I'm almost wondering whether we need a new word. That's <laughs> a very interesting point and perhaps we do. And I think what's interesting, when you do go through the newspapers, when you do go through press releases and things like that, uh, they don't usually say statistics. You sign up for um, one of these uh, strange um, uh, um, online panels, or even some of the slightly more, more um, upmarket ones, and they don't tell you they're doing this to collect statistics. They're doing it because they want to take the temperature of the public, all sorts of stuff like that. It doesn't say statistics. And maybe there's a lesson in that, in, in that for us. I mean, it's like uh, we have a teaching module at, at the Open University where I work, um, where we thought very carefully about its title. And we thought, well, we better say it's about statistics because it is, but that will lose potential students, so we called it practical modern statistics, and we thought we've got two words that they like and one that they won't like, and it's done okay. <laughs> so we could uh, thank Kevin once again.